Hello and welcome to our fascinating medical sciences lecture titled How Can We End Weight Stigma in Healthcare? First of all, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Marta Zakaria. I'm a current MSI Applied Medical Sciences student here at UCL and I'm your chair for today's event. Um, in today's fascinating lecture, Dr. Ansiza Kalea will present results from her team's study that explored several strategies to reduce weight stigma in healthcare practice and healthcare education. We want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible, so please make good use of the Q&A function on Zoom throughout the lecture to submit your questions for our speaker. And please use the hashtag on Twitter for this event, hashtag FMS lectures. So before I introduce our speaker, we'd just like to know a little bit more about our audience. So we are running um, the following poll, asking you to select the group you consider you belong to. Um, so the options are prospective students and their families, undergraduate students, um, postgraduate taught students, postgraduate research students, PhD students, academics, patients and uh, carers, and any other. I'll just give you a few more seconds to answer. Okay, thank you to all those voted, all those who voted. And we can see that the majority, 35% uh, actually are for our prospective students and their families. Thank you for joining us. And we look very much forward to welcoming you here at UCL. Um, and we also have a good percentage of current undergraduate students um, and um, just other uh, people from the general public here with us, and we're very grateful for you joining. Thank you. Um, so I'm delighted now to introduce our speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Anasiza Kalea, who is an associate professor teaching in the Division of Medicine and an honorary associate professor in the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. She is the academic director of the master's program in obesity and clinical nutrition at UCL. And with over 20 years of research experience, she has contributed to answering key questions on the role of dietary compounds in metabolic regulation and vascular function. Her research interests rely in the areas of precision nutrition and public health. Dr. Kalea has been a lecturer in world leading academic institutions in the UK and in the, and in the USA. And she's a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. She's a registered dietitian with the Health and Care Professions Council, a board member of the Nutrition Society, and a member of the British Dietetic Association. So thank you very much, Dr. Kalea, for joining us today. And now over to you. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to, um, to deliver this lecture. Um, and it's, a, it's great for you uh, that you have the time to listen to that. And hopefully I will share uh, some of our evidence, some of our work, and hopefully offer you some food for thought around this topic. And I found this topic very um, interesting at a time that we all are thankfully a bit more sensitive about equality, diversity, and inclusion, um, and uh, issues that um, and efforts that uh, are trying to ensure fair treatment and opportunity for all. And when we talk about EDAI, we have in mind that eradication of prejudice and discrimination on the basis of an individual or a group uh, of individuals protected characteristics. And I am aware that weight is not one of them, but maybe I'm gonna give you some food for thought to, to try to consider whether it should be perhaps. Now, let's start by asking you uh, whether you can match the words in the medal to one of the two pictures on the left and on the right. And if I ask you to go through this exercise, uh, some of you may go very quickly to make these associations and they will find it easy. And um, a few of you would be able to explain to me the logic behind it. The majority would claim that it's based on common sense. However, our common sense, which a uh, few people would argue is all that common, is based on our perceptions and it's formed around our experiences and the stimuli, the culture that we all grew up. Um, and many of us, even if we were trained as healthcare professionals, including myself trained as a dietitian uh, and having, having worked with patients in uh, many different countries and cultural settings, um, we wouldn't jump, in, jump immediately to conclusions, but we would be um, we would be 
our unconscious biases would lead us to rationalize some of our choices in the images above. And that would be that would happen even though we understand that obesity is a very co complex disease. We know that our genetics participates quite a lot um, on the regulation of our weights. Um, our genetics are responsible at a great degree on the regulation of our appetite. And we know that it is a disease that uh, we need timely and correct assessment. We need a holistic approach. We need a group of scientists to treat it, to treat that multifactorial nature of disease. And we need experts in nutrition and physical activity and behavioral therapy, people that uh, can propose appropriate treatments with drugs or sur surgery. And on top of that, we need the active participation of the family environment. So it is a complex condition. And even though we know that, we would very quickly jump um, and follow the stereotypes that we have been creating for, for a very long time. Now, if I ask you um, to search for an image in a search engine on a person living with obesity, you would not come across any of these images that I'm sharing with you here. Unfortunately, um, we, come with, we come across portrayals that perpetuate damaging negative weight-based stereotypes, and these contribute to the bias and discrimination that individuals are affected by this disease experience in their everyday lives. Um, and this, uh, on top of that, we have reports around the causes of obesity that are framed in a way that reinforce stigma. So you would rarely come across a person with excess weight buying healthy food, cutting a salad, going for a walk or riding a bike. But that, that is the things that these people do. And individuals affected by excess weight or obesity are people that, have, that are professionals, they have expertise, they hold leadership positions, they um, or authority, they have multiple skills in a range of activities and settings, and why wouldn't they? And a lot of us are affected by excess weight, and, and, uh, and still we do see this discrimination. And what was very interesting for me is to see that this is the case in a country like, uh, in, in a place like England, where almost three quarters of people aged 45 to 75 years of age are living with excess weight. So this is the purple color here and orange color. So even though we have quite a lot of people, um, um, quite a lot of us are affected by excess weight, we still have these discrimination, these biases, these negative uh, attitudes and beliefs around it. And if we look at the recent statistics, um, prevalence of overweight and obesity in England, it shows that uh, six out of 10 women and seven out of 10 men are living with excess weight, are living with overweight or obesity. And if we look at the more um, severe aspect of that spectrum, it's, it affects around three out of 10 women and two out of 10 men. Now, this has been the case for a while. This graph shows the prevalence of severe obesity among adults in England. And even though a very small proportion of the population are living with severe obesity, the rise in prevalence the last two decades has been increased sevenfold for men and threefold for women. So what this tells me as a healthcare professional is that it is a problem that has been affected for uh, for a very long time, a large proportion of the population. This report was produced um, a few over 15 years ago. It's called the Foresight Report to explore how the UK could respond to could respond to rising levels of obesity, and this is called the Obesity Systems Map. And it is judged for its complexity. This is the reason I have it here for this presentation to show that the individual is here in the middle in a complex disease like obesity and their food choices, poor unhealthy eating habits or uh, low levels of physical activity are only one part of the problem. The biology of the individual that would affect these food choices and they would lead to excess weight gain is a significant component to that, but also the environment that the individual lives around and would affect their personal choices. So this map helped us to visualize that concept of whole systems approach and appreciate that the food that is produced in a place that an individual lives, the societal influences, the socioeconomic status, the psychology, 
uh, the affordability, access to food, and the opportunities for activity, all of this contribute to what we call personal choices and, uh, and um, the formation habits. Now, weight stigma refers to all these discriminatory acts and ideologies targeted towards individuals because of their weight and size. And weight stigma is a result of weight bias. Weight bias refers to these negative attitudes and opinions associated with obesity, affecting people living with obesity. And the weight stigma, the obesity stigma, is that social mark or label that encourages the formation of stereotypes, putting labels to people, destroying their identity, and it has deep roots in our society. The extreme version of that would be the discrimination that people often living with obesity report. So this verbal or physical um, discrimination in relationships, in the professional setting, it can be discreet or it can be more overt. And all this would um, have different forms of actions and expressions. I'm not an obesity stigma expert, and there are many scientists uh, in psychology and social sciences that describe the stigma and the roots of it. But if I wanted to highlight a few, a few things that would uh, lead to weight biases, uh, they, they talk, the evidence base talks about these beliefs that obesity is a disease, is a condition that is controllable and is caused by controllable behavioral factors. Therefore, if someone shows less self-control, they, they are led to weight gain, which we know is not true. It's these beliefs around that desire for a thin body that is very common in Western culture. We don't see that in other culture settings. These ideological perceptions and personal traits, these feelings about appearance of each one of us us, um, that fascination with food, with hunger, with control, with desire. And we do live in a culture that um, encourages that obsession with good weight and bad weight. And that starts from the early from an early age, from the things we see at school or when uh, the, the TV that, that kids are watching, the films, uh, the Peppa Pig, the Biggest Loser, the, the Nutty Professor, all of this culture that has allow us, has encouraged us to associate success with somebody being of lower weight and higher weight being associated with somebody being less productive or less successful, no matter how we define success. The media, on the other hand, is an important and influential source of information about obesity. And the way that obesity portrayed is portrayed, but also the way that weight loss and weight maintenance are portrayed uh, described or framed, all these profoundly shape the public's, public's understanding, but also the public's beliefs and attitudes towards these impor important health issues. And often all these um, attitudes are not based on, on the evidence we have around such a complex uh, disease. Now, individuals that are affected by obesity or excess weight frequently confront stigma and discrimination, as I said, from the time they, um, they are in primary school. So we have um, uh, behaviors like bullying, or we know that we have um, uh, less uh, opportunities to, to be productive during the school years because you feel that discrimination, all that stigma re in relation to uh, their weight. So from the educational institution, institution to uh, the workplace, so people report that they felt discriminated by co-workers, so that has affected their progression to work. But what, what was interesting for me is that 64% of adults with obesity report experiencing weight bias from a healthcare professional. Now, as somebody that wears the hat of a healthcare professional, but also as someone that trains healthcare professionals, I was particularly interested to understand why, why exactly this is happening. Healthcare professionals, therefore, are not immune to weight stigma. And perhaps we may have a blind spot, which is perhaps we don't acknowledge all these unconscious biases. Now, for many, the stigma surrounding obesity is so deep that, as I said, we don't recognize it ourselves and we don't um, examine very often our views and our practices. This is a large study that was led by Rebecca Poole and Kelly Brownell. And um, they, they led quite a lot of these fields and um, they included around 2,500 participants. They asked both men and women to rate whether they had experienced weight stigma from each of the 20 categories that included family members, employers, dietitians, et cetera. 
And um, what they saw is that doctors, family members, and classmates were the most common sources of perceived biases uh, against the weight. So weight bias does persist into healthcare settings. And um, um, healthcare professionals like dietitians here who are trained to manage somebody's weight, um, they, uh, they show a propensity to ascribe stereotypical characteristics such as someone being lazy or non-compliant with somebody's weight. Now, looking at the way we train healthcare professionals, because I saw in the audience quite a few of you are considering UCL as your destination, one would hope that if you train, train a healthcare professional in managing people living with obesity, that would affect people's biases on weight. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, here's an older study that showed that tried to assess negative attitudes towards obesity, comparing um, students that studied dietetics versus students that studied a, a non-medical degree. And what they saw is that the majority of students agreed or strongly agreed with the stereotypes that overweight people overeat, people with overweight overeat, are inactive, slow, insecure, out of shape, and lack endurance, low self-esteem, and insufficient self-control. And this is the, the way they state their uh, results in this study. And the conclusion was that the dietetics curriculum does not adequately address weight bias. Now, a very interesting finding that I wanted to share today is that during um, the training of dietitians, uh, uh, they were given not the same group, but a different, different study. Um, they gave them some case studies um, after they uh, closed the completion of their degree. And they asked the students to, um, to address the lactose intolerance and suggest a treatment for these patients. Now, they decided to give um, that kind of case study to the students because that kind of condition, like lactose intolerance, um, they, would, they need to provide treatment options that are irrelevant or they, they are consistent regardless of the weight status. So they gave them four case study. One was a male patient that uh, had um, normal weight, one a male patient that um, uh, was affected by obesity, a female patient with normal weight, and a female patient living with obesity. Apart um, uh, from, um, um, uh, from the body weight or the body fat um, and the height, the percentage of body fat and the, the body mass index here, all the other descriptive characteristics, but also information around habits, likes, dislikes, physical activity, diet quality, uh, all of the other information across these profiles were, were exactly the same. Now, students who read profiles of patients living with obesity, they rated patients as less likely to comply with treatment recommendations, they rated their diet quality and health status worse, despite the fact that diet and lifestyle information that they had available for these patients was identical between these conditions. So we do carry these unconscious biases despite the training that we receive around the evidence base. Um, now, new nutritional strategies have been created to treat overweight and obesity, and they have become popular and widely adopted. However, they're based mostly on personal, on, on limited reports that are published in books and magazines rather on scientific evidence, because the scientific evidence we have says that to date, there's no one ideal diet for weight loss that would be appropriate for all individuals. We also know that food quality matters in health promoting weight loss diet, in a weight loss diet. To lose weight, the important component is to create a negative energy balance that is appropriate for each individual. And what we also know is that adherence is an important predictor of success. And when we looked at the dietary interventions or lifestyle interventions as well that uh, we have available for weight loss, even if we manipulate the macronutrient content, so low fat, high fat, low carb, high carb, if we manipulate the timing of eating, you know, eat the 5-2 diet, the 16, no matter what, what kind of duration of um, eating, feeding window you define, or 
even if we restrict specific foods or food groups, the result will be the same, and it is weight loss. The problem becomes with adhering to this diet long term. So, how sustainable is that pattern for long term? And um, how efficient, how effective it is to avoid uh, weight regain. So, in the short term, all these diets promote varying degrees of success, but in the long term, we are not very confident to say that one diet is better over another. So we have many unanswered questions. The kind of questions, so these are different types of diets and different types of interventions that were compared. And you do see that over the first year or a year and a half, that weight loss comes back. So we don't know, we have a lot of questions unanswered, unanswered as healthcare professionals. We don't know why some people experience successful weight loss while others are more resistant to weight loss. We don't know how do different diets alter hormone, hormone secretion, gut microbiome composition, gene expression. How do these changes regulate appetite and energy expenditure? One thing works for one person, another thing works for, na for, for another. So in the future, we need to investigate this further. So a persistent simplistic narrative that focuses on eat less and move more does not apply because uh, we do know that individuals cannot fully control their body weight through a specific behavioral choice. Um, so obesity is not a self-imposed condition with an easy way out. Solutions are not uh, that simple. So Considerable evidence exists to suggest that simply having a conversation about obesity can lead to weight loss, which is great. And that translates, translates into health benefits, which I will come back to. However, when we ask healthcare uh, practitioners and people living with obesity about it, they both report anxiety in generating this conversation, initiating this conversation. Because in the one case scenario, healthcare professionals are not, do not feel that they are trained um, in any setting, apart from people that are trained in, uh, in obesity and weight management. Uh, and people living with obesity have a fear of discrimination and stigma based on their weight, uh, which leads to them avoid seeking medical care. So that distrust of how they will be um, treated in a healthcare setting leads either to poor adherence to treatment, reduce trust and, and trust and good communication and good relationship with a healthcare practitioner is going to impact the success of their of the intervention. And um, uh, that these feelings of prejudice and discrimination would lead to increased anxiety that affects behavioral aspects. So they that may lead to disordered eating or comfort eating, lower motivation to engage with intervention, but also physiological responses. We know that cortisol is increased. We know that insulin resistance is more frequent. We know that increased inflammatory mediators are um, circulating and all of these would be barriers uh, for weight loss. They may lead to weight gain and they may lead to weight regain if some weight has been lost. All of these though contribute to low self-esteem due to someone's uh, body image. Now, how does this affect quality of care? Healthcare professionals all um, have reported to uh, all healthcare, all studies on healthcare professionals uh, show that there is a tendency to attribute these stereotypical characteristics to people living with obesity because of unconscious biases. In some cases, um, our patients are telling us that they don't feel that they have been given the advice, support, and care that they need. And research has shown that doctors are believed to spend less time with their patients living with obesity than the normal weight patients. Levels of patient center communication have been found to be lower with patients living with obesity. The patients, on the other hand, feel that they have been stereotyped in this way by primary care providers, and they don't feel that they're respected, and they feel that they, they, they invest less on their education on how to improve their health. Um, and all of these uh, leads to uh, lo less time to discuss negative symptoms and uh, reduce them on preventive health, care, health services and tests uh, and fewer interventions to prevent uh, a more serious complication. Now, the commonly held view that obesity is a choice and that it, it can be reversed by voluntary decisions to eat less and exercise more can mislead public health policies as well. 
So it's not only the individual that is affected, but it also leads to less investment on prevention. Uh, it leads to less funding for research, um, less in, uh, lower investment to cover obesity management. And all of that uh, increases the individual's burden from weight stigma, hampers obesity prevention and management, which is very different from what is happening in other diseases. In 2018, um, a report by the All Party Parliamentary Group on Obesity stated that only 26% of people with obesity reported being treated with dignity and respect by health professionals when seeking advice on treatment for their obesity. 42% of people with obesity did not feel comfortable talking to their doctor about their obesity. That means that they cannot have access to any treatment options that is available for them. So it was a little bit before we had um, the first uh, lockdown for COVID that this paper was published. I do remember the celebration of this joint international consensus statement um, on World Obesity Day that talked about actions to end stigma of obesity, and uh, talked about um, being aware of that and doing something about it. And many of us uh, were started thinking that if, um, if equipment, facilities, and treatments are inaccessible for the people that need them, if they feel embarrassed about their weight when they're entering in a healthcare setting, if they receive unsolicited weight loss advice because they cannot access the advice that has to be offered to them, uh, if patients receive inappropriate comments about their weight when they're treated and they're, they, they report that they're treated with disrespect because of their weight, then do we really talk about equal opportunities in healthcare? Because all access, availability, and acceptance uh, of their conditions um, are, um, are not there. So this generated uh, these ideas of, of a project that started um, right with the first COVID lockdown um, and discussions with patients that they were saying that uh, they don't mind the video uh, clinics that um, they were having because they felt that they were judged less going to the appointment and seeing a doctor because they feel judged in every step of their uh, lives. And all of these uh, made us think that if we are going to start creating a change, maybe we need to think of creating a map of how this change will happen from the education of healthcare professionals. If we have a complex disease that affects so many people, let's see what we can do about it. So with some fantastic colleagues, Dr. Adrian Brown, Professor Rachel Badaham at UCL, and a fantastic student, um, very excited about this project, uh, Brita Taluma. Uh, we produced a systematic review and we tried to, to go through uh, all the studies that were there and they looked at strategies in ending weight stigma in healthcare that were effective. We tried to see what works and what didn't. Uh, and we tried to include studies that looked at um, a seminar for less than a day to, to something that uh, was going on for three years in many different settings, from education to training uh, professionals to, um, to different research uh, activities. And uh, we included a large number of studies uh, applying our inclusion and exclusion criteria. I'm not gonna bore you with a methodology that would be more appropriate for a scientific uh, conference, but I will share some of our findings. So we looked at aspects like increased education on obesity, for different healthcare professionals and medical doctors. We talked about, we looked at uh, whether causal information and controllability, all these aspects would improve, um, would reduce obesity stigma. We looked at activities around empathy evoking methods. Um, we looked at uh, training around the locus of control, around the evidence uh, on obesity, weight inclusive approaches. And due to the complex nature of bias formation, we also looked at interventions that used a mix of various methods. And most of these interventions were delivered um, either in, in, in many different formats. So in a lecture or a tutorial, in, with a video, without a video, including reflective writing or have role play activities. And what we saw is that, um, uh, is that we have different dimensions uh, that we can target. 
Um, we do know from healthcare professionals that they feel inadequate in caring for patients with obesity unless their training is very specialized in that direction to deal with complex forms of the disease. Uh, but we were interested to see how could somebody design a comprehensive obesity curriculum in medical education and what kind of tools do we need to include? And what we saw is that uh, uh, some of them used um, uh, the evidence base around the social inequalities, the social influences around uh, obesity, and some others looked at um, um, genetics and appetite regulation. So we looked at education in healthcare professionals, professional practices, and research. And we felt that these were the three pillars, the three themes that we need to target independently. So our first conclusion was that weight stigma must be addressed early and consistently as soon as our students arrive throughout the education and practice. It's not something that they will be exposed the first term that they will arrive at university being trained to, 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 uh, towards a professional degree, but we need to have repeated this training throughout their uh, their training. We need to teach them about the evidence base, about the genetics and the social environmental determinants of weight, and to explicitly discuss the sources, the impact, and the effects of stigma. And that health education needs improvement, not only by introducing all these determinants of weight, but also through thorough discussions of the harm caused by social and cultural norms and messages concerning body weight. To highlight the fact that somebody is not having the same opportunity to access part of healthcare because of their body weight. We saw that there's a need to move away from an all weight centric approach and focus on something that makes a lot more sense. Um, outcomes and goals that uh, that focus on health, overall health, and include weight. If we know that if somebody loses 5, 10, 15 percent of their body weight, their health and quality of life is improved, that has to be our outcome, not just the number on the scales. And we have to redesign our treatments to having that kind of target. But also our research, we need to study the relationship at the research level between obesity and health outcomes and not isolate, not call our treatment successful if they if they reached a certain number um, of body weight uh, in the end of the intervention. But we need to, uh, we need to see the overall health um, in our research uh, uh, designs as well. And, um, and that will allow us to reduce that number of negative experiences that are reported by people who live with overweight and obesity and went through these uh, interventions and treatments. We need to propose a novel narrative about obesity, and that has to be coherent with the scientific evidence. It has to be respectful to the rights of individuals that are affected with this disease. And the ethical arguments and evidence base for the need to reduce this bias in healthcare are very strong. And while we are compiling this evidence about long-term stigma reduction, we need to prevent it. Uh, um, preventive action is needed. Now, how do we do this? So as a weight management professional, we need to start considering asking people about their previous negative patient experiences. Chances are that they're seeing a healthcare professional not for the first time, and they went through this path many times. And despite the discouragement, they're still there to ask for help. We have to appreciate, recognize that obesity is a product of many factors and explore all causes of problems, not just the weight. Recognize that many patients, as I said, are coming back to us for help. And that is very brave and we need to be there to facilitate and, and help um, and ask what, it, what kind of help they need. And emphasize the importance of behavior change, not just the weight. Recognize the difficulty in making lifestyle changes. We cannot expect that if we put somebody in a restrictive diet, it's fine for them to follow that for five years and recognize that small weight losses can improve health and consider that as an outcome. And then it made us think that as, as healthcare professionals, we need to start asking questions, spend some time for reflection. Do we make weight-based assumptions about people's intelligence or character or career success based on their weight? Are we comfortable working with people independent of their body image? Are we giving appropriate feedback to encourage healthy behavior change? 
Are we sensitive to their needs and personal concerns about um, their disease? Are we treating the per sorry, the person or the condition? And most importantly, do we listen properly? Do we listen to understand or do we listen to respond? To help us know this task, um, the World Obesity Federation, among other professional societies, have offered a set of tools. Waste stigma is one of the most common forms of discrimination in modern societies and manifests itself in a number of settings. So they have offered what is the evidence base around it, why it is not helpful in engaging the individual in their treatment path, what can we do about it? And that highlights, all this information highlights that pervasive nature of weight stigma, the impact it has on society, but also opportunities for policies to help reduce weight stigma and bias. There's a fantastic guide by the University of Connecticut Root Center for Healthcare Providers that talks about creating an environment to encourage patients with higher body weight to come and be treated. Focus more on health and wellness, less on weight or weight loss. Remove magazines and brochures, for example, from the waiting area that would encourage a stereotype propagation. Do not weigh patients or discuss their weight unless they would like to. Have gowns, chairs, blood pressure cuffs in the office that are designed to fit larger people. Install grab bars in the washroom. Have assistive devices. Be sure to have sitting that is appropriate, as I said. It is important to understand that all these guidelines that many professional societies, such as the British Dietetic Association here, or the Obesity UK, the Obesity Canada, all of these guidelines are about how to communicate as an organization and as healthcare professional, not the individual conversation with people living with obesity. Because in practice, if we want to establish proper communication to treat someone effectively, it's important to ask them first and listen to their, way, their wish and what kind of language is more acceptable for them to use. And part of that people first language for obesity that I wanted to highlight is the policy to put individuals before the disability or disease when we describe individuals affected by, by obesity. So rather than stating there are many obese and overweight people, use people first language. There are many people affected by overweight and obesity because labeling an individual by their disease dehumanizes the individual. We don't do that for other diseases. So all these thoughts and the map we provided were, was really positively uh, accepted by the media. There was a lot of discussion uh, a few months back around it, which was really nice to, nice to see. But still, even though our work was talking about using the right language, we saw the, the, the headlines here, obese patients, obese, obese patients, et cetera. And that, uh, that made me think um, that it was very appropriate uh, to consider um, at a time that discussions of equality, diversity, and inclusions are, uh, inclusion are very, um, very much live, all of us, we need to be more sensitive in the way to we portray people affected by obesity in the media as well. And we need to come up with some ideas, a strategy and map for many different settings. We try to do that for the educational setting, for the practice, for the uh, practice environment, but we need to have a, a map for the way we portray individuals in the media as well. And that was a nice uh, work uh, by the Root Center for Food Policy, again, the Obesity Society and the Obesity Action Coalition, that um, they do believe that mainstream journalists have an obligation to be fair, balanced, and accurate in their reporting about obesity. And they have offered a guide, if needed, to assist them in their uh, efforts to, to, to accurately report that, to ensure that we don't use thematizing language and we portray the individuals affected by excess weight appropriately. And that has to do with respecting diversity and avoiding stereotypes, using appropriate language and terminology, conduct balanced and accurate coverage of obesity, select appropriate pictures and images of individuals affected by obesity. Most importantly, we need to listen to our patients better empower their voice, because after all, all we're here to do is offer solutions that work for them. And I will finish uh, with an image that I saw in one of um, uh, Dr. Stuart Flynn's presentations a few years back, 
an expert in obesity stigma um, in uh, this country in Leeds, that says that no one is born hating another person because of the color of the skin, his background, his religion, I will add, of their weight. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Dr. Khalil, for such a fascinating lecture. Uh, really, again, thank you. And now over to the Q&A. So we already have actually a question come in and please um, please make use of the Q&A chat box, uh, Q &A box and, and send in more questions. Um, so the first question here that I have is, um, actually it's from the beginning, very beginning of the, of the lecture, uh, when you mentioned being, uh, um, and it says, when you mentioned being overweight, uh, do you take into account people who are more muscular than others? And then there's just a quick follow-up. Is this therefore being overweight and therefore more muscular, a good or bad in this sense? So I'm not sure if you can, uh, could you address this? Yes. Absolutely, yes. So no is the answer, the simple answer. Um, obesity is, is, um, is, a, uh, um, is referring to increased adiposity. So if somebody has higher BMI because they are performance athletes or uh, weightlifters, or be, be, they have higher uh, body weight for other reasons, a disease that increases fluid accumulation, or if they're pregnant, we don't take it into consideration. So in order to, uh, to come up with a diagnosis, we need timely and accurate assessment. And there are many tools that we use to do that and estimate somebody's body weight. Um, so BMI is a very rough tool that we use for populations to give us a rough idea whether we need to design some strategies for populations. But in order to diagnose obesity, we do know that this is a very poor way to, um, a very poor tool that we doesn't give us too much information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A very good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh... We are here waiting for more questions. So, so please, again, feel free to, um, to post them. Oh, there we go. Perfect, as I just mentioned. Um, so the question asks, well, I mean, you mentioned that weight stigma leads to one of the most common discriminations in our, in our modern society. Um, and why, why do you think it has taken, let's say, longer for our society to um, let's say, become more accepting of weight? Very interesting. Actually. I think it has taken very long to discuss about a lot of things that um, we were not discussing in the past. Um, so including uh, some of this weight. I think um, I'm, I'm an optimist <laughs> by nature. So I think that the environment on, on around this, the concepts of fairness and and um, uh, the discussions around equality and um, and and the knowledge base that we have that says that, well, hold on a minute, that's not what our evidence is saying. It's not, it's not just individual responsibility, this, this story. It has to do with, um, with a lot of um, socioeconomic factors that we like to ignore because we don't have very good solutions about. So the knowledge base, uh, but also an environment that encourages people to, empowers people's voices, have led to where we are and hopefully there's only um upwards from here mm -hmm. thank you um another question has come so um do you think that high numbers of people affected by obesity in population is an issue for public health it is an issue because obesity usually is associated with a range of comorbidities that um are linked with increased mortality. So we know that people uh, with excess weight, living with excess weight, they complain, they have um, um, uh, metabolic diseases of different sorts. Um, they report joint pains or they, uh, their quality of life is affected. So if we have a large portion of the population that is reporting poor quality of life because of that uh, disease, then yes, it does become a public health problem that we need to address. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Um, so next question. Um, well, despite, uh, despite the increased evidence that obesity is a complex and chronic disease, there are significant challenges in translating 
obesity science to, to, pol to policy, so to uh, ensure effective interventions. And what are your uh, recommendations, ideas in this regard? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, I think that has been the bottleneck for 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 many interventions. I think that what we we haven't done very well because the efforts are uh, have been there. But we, what we don't do very well is um, targeting the right interventions to the right people. Uh, what we also don't do very well is monitoring and evaluating our interventions. We have fantastic ideas and actions, but we don't necessarily evaluate them, evaluate properly what works and going back to um, to redesign them and, and optimize them. Usually the reason behind it is um, lack of funding to do that. Many of us are really passionate about nutrition research and, and obesity and, and lots of public health uh, problems, but um, but there is, I mentioned the, the clinical impact of stigma. I mentioned the lower investment on these efforts. And um, um, so therefore, I think this, this is something that we could definitely improve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, indeed. Um, Interesting question. So stigma, uh, of course, might start as a, as a child at school, for example. And so what um, the, the person asking the question asked for your opinion on perhaps how we could address this. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, and having experienced the teachings um, in, in school systems in different countries, uh, I have seen that in in most of the countries that I have lived. Um, one way of doing it, uh, apart from redesigning the national curriculum in every case, which is a challenging effort, is um, to start investing on educating teachers. Uh, we need to include um, more teachings about health, nutrition, physical activity in schools, but also have them delivered by people that have the right training. Um, we're, we need to have trained people to train teachers in order to provide the information in the right way and not uh, 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 because the same type of information needs to be um, presented for different audiences. Um, a six, a 10 year old or a kid in secondary school would understand very different things and these have to be communicated at a different level. Um, so therefore, this is one way to start. So if I had if I had a starting point, it would be to invest on a, a way to train teachers that would try to incorporate all this information. Um, and yeah, there are many other things that would be on my list, definitely. And they're part of the discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, an interesting question on... Um, let's say the research that is out there, asking if there is any research on isolating the health problems for the individual caused by purely the obesity versus the health problems caused by living with the stigma attached to the obesity, for example, the uh, stress that is caused by the stigma. If there's any research on isolating on... the health problems for the individual caused purely by obesity versus caused yeah. by living with the stigma attached to obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what kind of study design would do that. I, I can't say I'm aware of, um, I, I don't think I can answer this. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, we can't know everything, of course. Um, um, sorry, I'm just reading through the questions here. So um, do you think the portrayal of ideal weight and body image in the media has a negative impact on the people are trying to lose weight or perhaps positive impact. Absolutely. Many of these portrayals of idea, uh, ideal weight loss or ideal weight management are unrealistic. Um, and that is why um, um, going towards uh, this path to get um, evidence-based advice that would work um, is only leading to um, efforts that um, are unsuccessful in the end, and they, they discourage the individuals. Uh, so this is something that trained healthcare professionals know how to do to manage 
patient's expectations of what is expected uh, to happen and how to how to help them in this path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and another question, actually very interesting from the, the patient in some way patient side. So how can a patient encourage their healthcare professional to inform themselves of the day of this work that is um, being done? That goes back to 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 my comment on um, what we see from research is that both patients and uh, healthcare professionals in the primary care um, setting they're really um, anxious or they're not sure how to start this discussion. Uh, I think um, bringing that discussion um, with within the healthcare professional setting and trying to um, trying to ask for help with that, while highlighting some of these aspects uh, is only going to reduce that anxiety because the the, um, the healthcare professional will see that there is an interest and they would feel comfortable going through this path of discussing about stigma. Um, uh, but yes, I think starting the discussion would be the first uh, way around it. Mm -hmm, indeed, absolutely. Um, so we, at the moment, there are no more, uh, I mean, no more questions, but please feel free, we still have uh, some, oh, as I said, there we go. Um, when tackling childhood obesity, um, how is the best way, um, what is the best way to describe the situation to the parents so that they do not, that they reinforce these negative stereotypes to the, and also describe the situation to the children themselves? Mm -hmm. Very good question. And um, um, a study led by UCL a few years back uh, saw that um, the approach, um, the discussion around uh, children's weight with the parents requires a lot of sensitivity. Uh, parents come with a set of responsibilities around raising their children, um, many times competing responsibilities. And if uh, someone comes um, in an insensitive way to blame them for one more thing that didn't go as uh, it was expected, um, they would observe a defensive relationship, a, a defensive response, sorry. We did some work uh, with an amazing student that I had in the past, um, parents' perceptions and negative stereotypes um, in Mexico in children living with obesity. And what we saw is that uh, we need um, uh, we need to ask um, whether they're, we need to be sensitive about uh, how we would engage them and what exactly we would ask them to do and be confident also about what we would propose them to do, um, be confident about our interventions and how successful they are. Um, I think in all of these scenario, uh, trying to establish uh, a respectful communication and respectful relationship um, would uh, allow us to tackle um, difficult problems like childhood obesity a bit better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed, and I, I think also you know, respectful relations and everything just starts as well again from the family environment we were mentioning. And we have another question just about this um, and how, I mean, whether you think family pressures can also uh, reinforce this idea of, of weight stigma. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the slides that I showed is uh, they asked 2,500 people what would be, uh, who would be the group of people that they would uh, feel that they're stigmatizing them. Um, mm -hmm. That was patients living with excess weight. And among the three, four categories, it was family members. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, absolutely. They are, um, if you are referring, referring to beliefs and, and attitudes from family members, yes, that is there. Um, but I think empowering our patients living with excess weight, uh, with overweight and obesity, empowering them to call it off when it happens and have a, a discussion about it and and um, uh, raise their voice and, and say that this is not allowed is, is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh, and now we have a question on a, a, different, let's say a different perspective, asking whether there is the same stigma about those who live uh, with underweight. Yes. Yes, absolutely. This is the case. And there, um, 
there are many studies that anything that has to do with body image, it is related uh, to, to stigma. Uh, and yes, underweight, especially if it's associated with an eating disorder, people think they, they ignore the huge evidence base that this is associated, this is has a lot of aspects, it's a very complex um, uh, condition as well, and they, they ignore that complexity and they go directly by blaming the individual and their behavior. That That is, um, that mm -hmm. is not leading anywhere. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. Um... Again, we still have a couple of minutes for sending in uh, the last, really the last questions. I can ask mine in the meanwhile, now that there is none through. Um, but what is your perhaps, I don't know, best tip for someone like a student like me uh, for addressing this, in some, like just day-to-day -day life, what could I do to address the weight stigma that there is, that exists? I think to stop it when it happens, to raise your voice, like with any type of discrimination, it doesn't just apply to stigma. Um, I would say that any time that anyone feels that uh, they are discriminated, they have to raise their voice and say, "This I cannot allow that." Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what the setting, um, and we have to learn a lot from other types of discrimination, and and try to to get some better ideas. But I think what I need to um, yeah, I think that that would be my advice. Not again. I'm not an expert on obesity stigma. I'm not a psychologist. I would turn to to a colleague with that kind of expertise for better advice. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I would um, what I would advise uh, on this uh, aspect for somebody that is treating or will be treating people with uh, obesity is to try to listen better to people mm -hmm. because they may they may be calling that discrimination with a very low voice. So we have to listen a little bit better if they're objecting, if they're objecting to the language we are using. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. I think raising, um, raising our voices is just, yeah, the way at least to, to start to start change uh, in any in any field and in this field uh, in particular. Um, yeah. So, and I guess change starts from us. So again, um, oh, will the recording be available? Very good question. And the answer is yes, it will be available online. Uh, you can find us um, just by searching UCL uh, public lectures and there is a lecture series and we're the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Um, so, so yeah, we'll be there and uh, very pleased if you do go back and, and listen to the wonderful lecture that by Dr. Philly again. So thank you, thank you for asking about this. Um, and yeah, we do have just just really under three minutes, two minutes left, um, but really uh, time is almost up. Um, and, and we would be grateful, I'll just use this time just to mention that we would be really grateful if you had um, any feedback to so please provide us with your feedback uh, by filling in the survey that will just be sent out just at the end of, uh, of, yeah, of the session now, um, and um, and we would be really really appreciating your your feedback. Thank you once again for for joining this um, lecture, for interacting so much with us, and uh, we really hope you you appreciate it as much as I mean, as, as at least as much as I did. And, and again, thank you for your comments and questions, and a great thank you um, to to Dr. Kalea really for giving her her time for this excellent lecture. And I just want to wish everyone an excellent evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.